Thank you uh, so much, Arby. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, another model system uh, which uses uh, patient stem cells. Um, <clears throat> and specifically today, I'm going to talk about the uh, Alexander disease, uh, the stem cell from Alexander disease patients. Um, we all know that uh, Alexander disease <clears throat> is caused by mutation in the GFAP gene or into the pioneer work by R.B. James and uh, others. And that mutation <coughs> results in the pathology in astrocytes, in particular the protein aggregation. And, but not only in astrocytes, it also leads to changes in uh, neurons and then polydendrocytes. And so actually it's a global disease, even though the mutation is only in one of gene uh, in the astrocytes. And it leads to many different kinds of uh, clinical manifestation depending on uh, uh, multiple factors. And the protein, uh, we, you already have seen this uh, kind of structure many times. Um, <clears throat> now, you also have heard that in the morning that there are many model systems uh, from fly, cells, mice, and rats. And these animal models are really, really useful because they actually teach us a lot of information about how the mutation in this gene lead to the pathology uh, and, and then lead to the uh, change in the brain. Um, and also, you have heard that, that those uh, models are actually also useful for developing therapeutics, and at least for testing therapeutics. <coughs> of course, uh, th they are also have uh, some difference because they, are, they can fly, we cannot fly, and uh, sometimes they crawl, we, we, when we were small, we still crawl, but, but they are different. And so each animal model teaches us something, but not everything. And so, so today, uh, now I'm going to talk another model uh, so that whether we can uh, look at the uh, human cells directly. And why is that? Because uh, again, um, owing to the pioneer work of our experts here, like Mike and Steve Goldman and many others, that uh, have shown that the, actually the astrocytes we are talking about, they are quite different between you know, animals and humans. For example, we have a lot more astrocytes in our brain over like animals, and they are bigger, more processes, and, uh, <coughs> and they wrap a lot uh, neurons and uh, synapses, and so, uh, and also, uh, astrocytes, you know, they talk to each other through some signaling, like a calcium signaling, and, and they actually travel much faster than that in animals. And so the question is, uh, you know, whether we can actually directly look at uh, hu human, particularly patients, uh, astrocytes. And so <clears throat> how are we going to do that? So one way we can do it is to take a patient's cells, whether it's skin cell or blood cells, and then we can actually grow this skin cell or blood cell in a petri dish, and then we uh, use genetic approach or some other ways to turn them into another type of cell called the induced pluripotent stem cell, or IPA cell for short. And this cell can be actually <coughs> grown for a long period of time, um, and then uh, continued uh, for other uh, studies. And what we have taken is uh, from uh, two patients uh, who have these uh, two mutations at uh, either end of the G GFAP genes. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, these cells, uh, as uh, uh, Natasha mentioned, that uh, because uh, each of us differ from each other, and so it's actually very difficult to compare each other. And so what we have done actually 
is to have these two patients' mutation actually corrected by genetic means, and so that they now uh, becomes normal. And so we can actually compare the same person before and after. And so that will make things a lot easier. So now, <coughs> so we have the cells. What are we going to do? And so the first step is we have to turn them into astrocytes, right? And there are multiple steps uh, to get there. So the first step is to turn the iPA cell to brain stem cells. And, and that actually is a pretty straightforward step. It actually takes about one to two weeks. And these stem cells grow like this, a cluster of cells. And then in about one to two weeks, they actually change to another form and shape, and they organize into the structure very much like the earliest brain in our brain, uh, like, a, like a tube, like a flower. And they express the same type of genes and they behave very much like what's in the brain, and that's uh, in the early stage in the brain. Now, the second step is we have the, now we change the stem cell to brain related, and then we need to guide them further to become astrocytes. And that step is very long. Uh, why? Because in our brain, it takes several months to produce astrocyte, and that actually happens in a petri dish. And uh, it takes about three months to begin to see all astrocytes, and then by six months we got a lot of astrocytes. And so it's a very long process. Um, but uh, you know, it mimics what's happening in our human development. Now there are many different kinds of uh, astrocytes. The astrocytes in brain, spinal cord, and elsewhere, they are different. So how are we going to get this kind of exercise? And so we actually have developed these uh, tools. Uh, <coughs> for example, the brain stem cell usually generate uh, this uh, uh, cerebral cortical type of uh, nerve cells. But uh, if we want to get other parts of the brain, and we actually can use, uh, let's see, one molecule molecule called the hedgehog actually can turn them into the ventral part of the brain and so, so that they can generate different kinds of the nerve cell in the brain. But what if you want the cell to become in the midbrain, hindbrain, spinal cord? And that actually is also simple. We teach the cells with another molecule uh, that activate the wind pathway and so that they can become diacephalon, Midbrain, hindbrain, spinal cord cells, and so, and we can generate this kind of neuron and the astrocytes in the same way, and we can generate the, the astrocytes in the brain, and spinal cord, dorsal, or ventral, whatever type of uh, astrocytes we want. Okay, now we, <coughs> now we actually. Uh, in our lab, over the past uh, couple of decades, we actually can generate uh, pretty much any kind of uh, nerve cells or glial cells from this uh, human stem cell. Okay, now we have astrocytes, right? So, what, what do, do they happen when we take the cells from Alexander's patients? And the first thing we look at is, uh, you know, whether the exercise actually have the same type of uh, the so-called aggregate. And it turns out that <coughs> in the mutation, and you actually see this uh, aggregation of this GFAP in those exercises. And uh, we can magnify the U with uh, super resolution microscopy and you can see this aggregation coming from those uh, filamentous uh, uh, GFAP. And when we correct the mutation now here, and then those uh, aggregation disappears. Um, and similar, we can look at even deeper with electron microscopy and you can see these fibers, GFAP fibers, coming, you know, and in some area they form this aggregation, but once the mutation is corrected, then it's no longer there. 
And so <coughs> now we have the, the disease uh, pathology, right? We have uh, this from patients. Um, <coughs> and once we correct the mutation, it, it, it's go away. So that means the mutation really is the cause of this uh, pathology. So, <coughs> so what, what does this uh, mutation and aggregation mean? Uh, uh, what are the uh, uh, consequences of this mutation? And so we actually took those cells and then uh, look at the, the gene profiles uh, of these cells by comparing to the ones that are corrected. And of course, there are thousands of genes that are altered by this mutation. But if we, if we kind of uh, analyze them carefully and uh, look at them, it turns out that uh, these genes that are altered by the GFP mutation often are related to this, uh, 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 this uh, membrane you know, organelle movement or function. And it's, uh, it's very interesting and the, whether it's uh, increased or, or decreased, they often are related to this uh, uh, kind of uh, genes. And so that analysis kind of like a fishing expedition, but that uh, actually tells us where to look at. And so we, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, just a couple of examples what are these uh, areas uh, uh, is altered because these are related to this uh, membrane or, or, or you know the molecules come in and out uh, all these uh, uh, structures and so the first thing we look at is like uh, one is called the endoplasmic reticulum it's called short for ER and it turns out that uh, in these patient cells and this kind of organelles are kind of uh, localized only surrounding the nuclei. Um, in the normal one and after correction, and then they can distribute to the processes. And the, in both patients, they look the same style. And under electron microscopy, and not only the localization is altered, the structure, uh, the morphology is altered, also altered because they become swollen, and, and you know, this kind of structure. Um, <coughs> another organelle is called the lysosome, and you see it, it's in green, and you, you also see it's kind of a localized surrounding the nucleus in the normal one, and it can distribute the relatively evenly. And we can take another organelle, let's say mitochondria. You see in the patients, they, again, they kind of localize in surrounding the nuclear. But in, when, once it's corrected, they, then they can distribute to evenly, uh, including the processes. And so it's a kind of very common feature that uh, once the GFAP is mutated, for some reason, we, we don't know yet, all this cellular organelle kind of stuck together in a certain area and say to, they do not distribute the well enough. And that actually gives us uh, some uh, clue, you know. If these organelles kind of stuck together in the, in the center, they, they actually cannot get out or get in, and, and so that becomes uh, crucial, uh, 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 important because uh, for a normal cell to function, you need to you know, take some in, get something out. You already heard of this. And, uh, and because of the uh, mislocalization of this organelle, and you can imagine that this kind of function you know, must be somewhat altered. And that uh, really leads us to next question, you know, uh, uh, what are the functional consequences? And I'm going to give you one example. And so we look at uh, one function, you know, it's, uh, I mentioned earlier, when astrocytes, they talk to each other, they use uh, some uh, signaling molecule, like calcium, you know, uh, transmitters. And uh, when is uh, calcium signaling? And uh, uh, normally, <coughs> uh, when we stimulate the cells and, and the 
uh, fluorescent, uh, we, we basically use the green fluorescent dye and they can travel through. And for example, we hit the, in the uh, left uh, uh, up corner, and this is in patients, say us, and suppose that they shall travel through, but they kind of uh, stay there, didn't go uh, any further. And you wait the way that they just stay there and do not talk to the next one. And, but then the next uh, uh, image <coughs> actually is from the same patient, but uh, we already correct the mutation. And we, we did the same experiment. And we hit the, this area, uh, just punch it, uh, uh, touch it, and then the signal uh, does not show up. Is that the. Ah, here, here you go. And so, and then once the mutation is corrected, now the same from the same patient, and the, the signal goes through. So, so what it says is that, that somewhat the, the communication is uh, altered by the GFP mutation. Now, what? <coughs> what are the uh, 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 molecules, signaling molecules? And so we know that the, this calcium wave propagation often, you know, it's dependent upon another molecule. It's called ATP. Probably everybody heard of it. It's an energy molecule, but uh, it's also a transmitter. And so we spend quite a bit of energy to look at, uh, you know, what's wrong with the GFP. Does this do the Sales produce uh, um, ATP or not? Because they are fa they fail to do that, and uh, we did uh, a number of experiments. And turns out that they actually can produce ATP. The second question is, what they produce, and the next uh, sale next to the producer sale, whether they can respond to it or sense it. Um, and uh, we look at this. It turns out that they actually can respond to ATP, right? Now, what's next? And so they can produce it, uh, the next cell can respond to it, what, what, what else? The third question is, oh, the, uh, the cell may be produced, but they do not uh, release it to the next to cell, and so that the cell cannot uh, respond. And it, it turns out that uh, that's exactly the case, you know. Even the cell produce ATP, they cannot actually release out, and so that next cell can respond to it. So that's why they fail to talk to each other. Um, so that is the summary. Um, so the normally, actually, GFAP, you know, is important. It turns out. You know, they even, you know, well distributed, and so they actually help all these organelles to distribute uh, 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 in different parts of the cells. And once the GFAP is mutated, and we, in some cells we see these aggregates, and, but more importantly, a somewhat uh, miss uh, uh, regulate uh, many other parts, particularly these organelles. I, I give a few examples. And so that leads to the problem in secretion or uptake or this kind of uh, shuttling of molecule between, uh, in, inside the cell and between the cells. And that, we think, is the problem. Of course, that's just a, a kind of a phenomenon. and. Uh, What's exactly the molecule that the, the mutant GF or the normal GFP talk to, and we don't know yet, and that's what we are trying to figure out. And then once we figure out this, and the next question is how this dysfunctional uh, uh, exercise lead to the global change I mentioned from the beginning, you know, neuronal degeneration, myelin uh, disorders. Of course, the most important part for all of us here is how to stop or reverse the process, right? And so I think uh, the stem cell model can also be used for that purpose. 
Right? Just like what we did in the past, actually, we worked on a couple of uh, very rare diseases. For example, the spinal muscular atrophy. We, we, once we discovered the, the target, and we actually worked with NIH, and screen the molecule, and it turns out that we screened a couple of uh, many libraries, they found a few molecules, and these molecules uh, actually turns out to be the drug developed by these big companies now in phase three clinical trial. And we only identify a few of them, actually. Two of them actually were the right one. Um, and this one actually is the positive control, three of them. And uh, we, did a similar work on ALS, another fatal disease, and because in we because we identified the target, and so <coughs> we screened uh, several libraries, and we didn't find any of them. Actually, we only found a few molecules that uh, now we use it as positive control, and now it's in the hands of uh, medicinal chemists to try to redesign the chemistry, and so the stem cell model can also be used as a tool t for testing uh, drugs. Okay, I will end up here by thanking uh, a lot of people, in particular the Alexander disease patients who donate the samples for us to generate the stem cell for study. And the work was done mostly by Jeff, uh, my former graduate student who is now a postdoc at the SOC, and a lot of others, including Tracy here. And I have to say, this study wouldn't have started without Albi, who convinced me to work on uh, Alexander <laughs> disease. And also, I mentioned that uh, we have a program, you know, with Mel, Martin, and the several others in the program. And, you know, we constantly communicate with each other, try to move the field forward. And I will stop here by. Uh, uh, answering any question you may have. Any questions? Yeah, so we actually did that uh, piece of, it doesn't appear to co-localize with the lysis of markers. Um, I think that my, my student did that, that we specifically look at that. In IPS. In IPS, the right, uh, extra mm -hmm. Shan, do you want to say something about um, IPS cells in transplantation? IPS in transplantation as therapy as therapeutics. Yeah, so that is uh, actually one of my main focuses in my lab, and that's also related to my own personal uh, <coughs> uh, things uh, uh, because uh, uh, because of that reason, we actually spend a lot of energy try to develop a cell therapy for a number of. Uh, neurological conditions. So the first one we are working on uh, is uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, we are now, we did uh, uh, studies in rodents and uh, primates and we are now moving on to clinical trial. And the second part is related to my own condition. That's why I move on to spinal cord injury and I started uh, developing uh, cells for spinal cord injury. Now it's in preclinical pre -clinical stage in the spinal uh, injured uh, monkeys. For Alexander disease, I don't know how to use uh, stem cell therapy, uh, transplantation therapy, because uh, we know that the, all the, the exercises are 
portal that throughout the brain and spinal cord. So if we want to replace SSI, we, that means we have to replace everything in the brain. It's, it's pretty tough. I don't know, it might work from early on in neonatal, I don't know. Um, and so the gene therapy might be better, right? If we correct the mutation, then it will work better. But I don't know whether cell transplantation will work in Alexander disease, at least for astrocyte replacement. I, I think maybe for some other type of uh, cell therapy, like uh, relating to inflammation or some other immunomodulation, this type of may be different. I think uh, Jim mentioned the inflammation. You know, nowadays uh, there are a number of trials for even autism, I think uh, using a cord blood cell or some other type of cell just for modulating inflammatory or some other type of uh, aspects. But, but I guess it's not for, in the end, it does not really correct the mutant uh, astrocytes. Yeah. I have a question, I'm not sure if it fits with stem cells exactly, but I'm just wondering if it's ever been considered talking about how the, there's this long way and aggregation. Is there any way to disperse that? Oh. Is this a lymphatic system that I can talk about? Mikein's method that might work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how to this. Uh, I mean, uh, Natasha's. Uh, strategy, you know, try to modify the protein, it's possible, right, Natasha, to sort of uh, dissolve it, disperse it, or something like that. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. So. Um,